The Game Boy Game of the Week is Barai Fighter Deluxe. This game came out in the beginning of 1991, making it one of the earliest releases for the Game Boy. I didn't know anything about this game at the time, other than it had a really cool dragon on the box art. I only actually tried this game out for the first time recently, and oh my goodness, I love this game. This game gets so much right, and I'm really excited to talk about it. I also discovered a couple of crazy differences between the version that was released in Japan and the version we got in the US that I'll get to in a little bit. So let's dive in. This game is a side-scroller shoot-em-up. Now I have a complicated relationship with these kinds of games. I love the concept and I think they can be a lot of fun, but I am so bad at them. Like most of the time in these types of games, I don't make it past the first stage. Thankfully, that's not the case in Barai Fighter Deluxe. First of all, one thing that's unique in this game is that you can fire your weapon in all eight directions. You can hold a button to lock the direction you're shooting in while you continue to move around the screen. It's a lot of fun. Another thing that's kind of unique is the way the screen scrolls. Much of the time, the screen scrolls to the right, like most other games like this. But at times, this game will switch things up, and it'll be scrolling to the left, or scrolling up, or down. Sometimes you'll travel back through a section of the stage that you've already played through, but this time coming from a new direction, with new enemies and new power-ups. It wasn't really necessary for the developers to add this, but it's a simple way to keep things fresh in the game. It keeps the player on their toes, and forces them to think about firing in all directions, and not just to the right. One thing I hate about other games like this is instant death whenever you brush against a wall. You get your spaceship a little too close to the mountain and boom, you're dead. I mean, I guess it makes sense, but that doesn't mean I like it. I think most of the times I die in these types of games is because I run into a wall. Anyway, that's not the case in this game. You can hug the walls, you can fly right alongside them with no penalty. It might be a small thing, but for someone who's as crappy at these games as I am, it makes a big difference. Another thing this game gets right is the enemy layout. Uh, it's not uncommon in these kinds of games to get a wave of enemies like from one side of the screen, and then the same wave of enemies from the other side of the screen, and then to have the exact same pattern of enemies repeat. Basically, in a poorly designed shoot-em-up, this just amounts to boring filler. I'm happy to say I did not experience any of this in this game. Instead, this game keeps me on my toes. Enemies come from the right, and then the left. Now a new type of enemy appears. Now there's environmental hazards and enemies. Now the screen is scrolling in a new direction. It's really well done and never starts to feel old. The way weapon power-ups work in this game is quite clever, but a little confusing at first. So you always fire your starting gun but there are also three other weapons you can collect that allow you to shoot in multiple directions at once, or even through walls. You'll start shooting the new weapon as soon as you collect the corresponding power-up, but then when you collect another power-up, it looks like nothing happens. So the way power-ups work is each weapon can be upgraded up to 10 times, but you won't actually see any change in the weapon you're firing until you've collected five of the same power-up. And then it upgrades again when you've collected ten. Uh, the game gives the player a lot of opportunities to collect power-ups, but not too many. I'd say it's quite balanced. You can change between the different weapons by just collecting one of the power-ups that corresponds to the weapon you want to use. Uh, some power-ups are better for a specific part of a level, and some bosses are weak to a specific weapon, so it can be beneficial to switch. Uh, but here's the thing. When you die, you lose all of the power-ups you've gained for your currently active weapon. So it can be tempting to just stick to your favorite weapon 100% of the time, but if you know you'll need it coming up, it may help to switch to another weapon for the time being in case you do die. <laughs> I love this power-up mechanic. Uh, something other shoot 'em ups struggle with is what to do with power-ups and less skilled players. Uh, better players will collect more power-ups, they'll become overpowered, and just plow through the levels. But a less skilled player, one who misses power-ups and dies a ton, will constantly be reset to having to play with no power-ups. And that's no fun. 
Uh, this game finds a great middle ground where you only lose the power-up you are actively using. It's a consequence of dying, but isn't sending the player back to ground zero with every death. Uh, the ve developers came up with a great solution here. The game has five stages, and in my opinion, they are laid out masterfully. Uh, they're not short, but they don't overstay their welcome. Each stage kind of follows a pattern where it goes from straight action to changing up the direction of the level, uh, then going back again, and just when the level is about to feel a little too long, uh, there's what I call a bridge section. That means you're coming up to the boss. Uh, it's really nice. The game does not have a battery backup. Instead, uh, this game gives you a simple password when you beat a stage. Uh, the only thing the passwords record is the stage you're on and the difficulty level, which works out fine. In regards to difficulty levels, this game has everything. Uh, when you start up the game, you can choose between easy, medium, and hard difficulty levels. With more enemies, uh, new enemies, and tougher enemies, the harder you, you pick. Uh, if hard mode is too easy for you, don't worry. There's an extra super duper hard mode waiting for you after you beat the game. And if easy mode isn't easy enough for you, there's a simple password you can enter that gives you 99 lives when you start the game. I am a huge fan of letting the player play the way they want to play. Just let the player have fun. And in an era where most video game difficulty was you get what you get, and if you want to get any fun out of your new video game, you just got to get good. The way this game does things is so refreshing. Uh, this game also does things right when it comes to extra lives and continues. So every level has a ton of checkpoints. So when you die, it actually doesn't send you back to that, that far, which is great. It's challenging, but the game doesn't waste the player's time by making them replay a large section of the game that they already did. When you lose all of your extra lives, you're allowed to continue from the beginning of the level you're currently playing, which is perfect. <laughs> There's a cool gameplay mechanic for extra lives, too. Uh, many times when you kill an enemy, they'll leave behind these little coin things, uh, and if you collect enough of them, you get an extra life. But you can also choose to use them to fire off a bomb that clears uh, the screen of all enemies. So it's kind of a fun trade-off mechanic. Uh, do I clear the screen of enemies, or do I save up for an extra life? It's kind of cool. Alright, on to the graphics. The graphics in this game are both a blessing and a curse. Uh, the designers did the thing where all the foreground elements, you know, the player, the enemies, the bullets, the walls, uh, they're all shades of dark gray and black, and the backgrounds are almost pure white. Uh, the benefit of this is that it makes it super clear where the enemies are, and for a fast-paced action game, this is super important. The drawback is, well, even though the character sprites look good and are well drawn, they're all super dark and look kind of muddy and ugly. Yeah, even so, I commend the designers for the backgrounds. They didn't just leave them plain white, but, but instead used a light gray to add some patterns. Uh, this looks so much nicer than leaving it plain white, and it makes it easier to see which direction the stage is currently scrolling into. <sighs> oh my gosh, I can't stand it when games uh, leave the background plain white. Uh, games like Star Wars Super Return of the Jedi, or Turrican, or Earthworm Jim, and even the Donkey Kong Land games to some extent. I know, it takes extra memory to add more tiles to the background, and I know it can make the game look more cluttered, but man, leaving it blank just makes the world look so empty and dead. Uh, games that avoid this look are games like the Kirby's Dream Land series, uh, Super Mario Land 2, uh, all the Ninja Turtles games. Oh well. Uh, all things considered, uh, the way that the developers were able to pack this much game that looks this good in a minuscule 64k ROM uh, makes Barai Fighter Deluxe all the more impressive. Uh, as for the music, uh, well, the music in this game is excellent. Like, the stage one theme gets stuck in my head every time I play this game, and I don't even care because it's so good. Unfortunately, we've come to what is probably the biggest complaint I've seen about this game. Uh, the sound effects are very poorly mixed. 
like stage one should sound like this. But because you're constantly firing your gun, it ends up sounding like this. So I tried comparing it to Gradius, another shoot 'em up for the Game Boy that's known for having excellent sound, and I couldn't quite put my finger on what they did differently. Uh, the weapon sound effects in Barai Fighter Deluxe are definitely too loud, so first thing I do is I lower the volume on those. Other than that, uh, the game plays the sound effects on channel 2, which is where the bass line is playing, so the bass line cuts out whenever you fire your weapon. I think this is pretty common for games of this era, but I can't quite figure out why it doesn't work here. Maybe they're trying too hard, and like a much more simple pew pew sound effect would have served the game better than the more complicated laser type sound effect they went for. <sighs> oh well. All I know is, if your game is going to have a sound effect that the player is going to have to hear constantly, then it better sound good, or the player is not going to have a good time. Also, there is a strange glitch in this game that makes it only playable on the original Game Boy and the Game Boy Pocket. Uh, what happens is, the player will just kind of randomly die, usually around the Stage 2 boss. <laughs> like, you're playing the game and suddenly, boom! You just kind of explode. There's nothing on the screen. Uh, I assume this is one of the reasons they released a color version of the game uh, called Space Marauder that works on the Game Boy Color and the Game Boy Advance. Alright, so when I decided I wanted to own a copy of this game, I did some research to see what the differences were between the American and the Japanese release, and I really didn't find any info online. I mean, one website pointed out that the American version has a two-player versus game, which I haven't tried out, uh, but since I wasn't planning on playing against someone on another Game Boy anytime soon, I decided to check out the Japanese version. The first thing I discovered was, in the Japanese version, the player character moves faster. I actually made a video demonstrating the speed differences, I'll put a link to it in the description, uh, I don't know for sure why the American version was slowed down, but my best guess is uh, the Japanese version came out first, and when it came time to release the game in America, they decided to slow down the player character just a little bit. Uh, one, to make the game a little easier, and two, to combat some of the motion blur that happens on the original Game Boy screen. I don't know. Anyway. I wanted the true speed of the fast-paced original, so I opted for the Japanese version of the game. <laughs> the other difference I discovered, and this is huge, um, is that the final boss in the Japanese version is completely different than the American version. And not just the American version, uh, there are five versions of this game. Uh, so what is it? There's the American and the Japanese versions of the Game Boy game that we've already talked about. Uh, there's the American NES version, there's the Japanese Famicom version, and finally there's the Game Boy Color version. And every one of them has the same final boss, except the Japanese Game Boy version. The final boss in all the other versions is this super cool dragon, which coincidentally is the same dragon that's featured on the box art of the game. But the final boss in the Japanese version is this. The first time I got to the final boss, I thought to myself, huh, maybe they put the dragon after this boss? But nope, this is it. Now, what's really been boggling my mind is, why is the final boss in this one version of the game different from all of the other versions? And unfortunately, I have no idea. Uh, the Japanese Game Boy game came out after the original NES release, so... Maybe they wanted to add the dragon, but couldn't get it to work on the Game Boy in time for the release date? Uh, but even that doesn't really make sense to me, because it's not like the boss they replaced it with seems that simple to implement or anything. 
it's a pretty complicated battle. Maybe they wanted something unique for the Game Boy version, but then decided the dragon would be cooler for the American audiences? Yeah, I don't know. It's a mystery to me. Anyway, when I discovered all this, I was super bummed. This final boss looks so lame compared to the dragon, but honestly, I kind of prefer the final boss in the Japanese version. It doesn't look nearly as cool, but the battle is a lot more interesting and also a lot more satisfying when I beat him. And if you're wondering, well, why would they put a picture of the dragon on the box art if there's no dragon in the game? Well, that's because the Japanese box art doesn't actually have the dragon on it. It just has the spaceman slash mech player character. It's hard to do an action game on the Game Boy. The screen is small, uh, the hardware doesn't allow for many sprites on the screen at once, and motion blur can make things even harder to see. But in my opinion, this is one of the best action games for the Game Boy. Uh, there's tons of enemies, tons of bullets, fast movement, but never so fast that I don't feel like I'm in control. If I had to make one change to the gameplay, I think I'd prefer it if the player had a life meter instead of one hit deaths, and maybe have the level design make up for it with a few extra enemies. Uh, this would allow for the action to continue uninterrupted even when the player makes a mistake or two. Uh, but really, the way the game is now, it really is a fun, solid action game. So, in conclusion, this game has good graphics that serve the gameplay perfectly. It has outstanding music that's hindered by overbearing sound effects. The scaling difficult is implemented wonderfully. And it has enough unique gameplay to really make it stand out compared to other games of this type. But ultimately, I can sum up my opinion of this game in one sentence, and that is, every time I pick this game up, I can't put it down. <laughs>